Well, I am excited to welcome you here. If you're a first-time guest to Aspire San Marco, I want to say a special welcome to you. Um, This is a great week to jump in with us at Aspire Church because we are getting ready to start a brand new series uh, next week. And I'm actually doing something I haven't done before. I'm giving you a warning sermon to get you ready for the series. So uh, this series that we're getting ready to embark on is something that uh, for many of you are, are familiar with the material. It was written over 30 years ago by a man named Henry Blackaby called Experiencing God. And the whole premise of Experiencing God is how do you know and do the will of God? Now, I'm sure nobody in here has ever asked that question before. How, how do I know and do God's will? But it is something for the next several weeks we are going to look at. How do we know and understand and actually do the will of God? But before we get into that series, which will start next week, I want us to answer a more fundamental question. Because it occurred to me that until we are in fact in a place where we want to know the answer to that question, it does no good to try to answer it. It does no good for us to explore how do you know and do the will of God if we aren't first in a position in our own hearts and lives to care what the will of God is and to say yes to the will of God before we even understand it. This is what Christ has called us all to as followers of Jesus. This is what it means to walk by faith. That it, you don't know the answer. You don't know the outcome. You don't know the consequences before you say yes to God. Are we willing to say yes to God? Are we willing to live lives that are in full surrender to God, that just say, that live in such a way that say, God, whatever it is, whatever your will is, my answer is yes before I know, before I understand, and if I never know, and if I never understand. So I want to set the stage for the series by looking at a passage of scripture that's fairly familiar. It's John chapter 15. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open there to John 15. And I think we can try to answer this question or try to at least come to understand our readiness to know and do the will of God by talking about straws, garden hoses, and ghost riders. So we're going to look at John 15 and we're going to talk about this to see if we can truly understand the will, to, to understand to, to the desire to know and do the will of God. And before we do this, I, I need a volunteer. I need somebody to volunteer. Um, everybody's a little nervous. I, I can tell most of you have been in church before because do I have any, vol- I don't have a volunteer anywhere in the room. No volunteer whatsoever. Okay, Susan, come on up, Susan. Now, Susan, just I have not talked to you before this, right? Okay, some people suspect, yeah, we've talked together, but we've never talked about what I'm gonna ask you to do right now. Because some people always suspect that I plan this out. And I, I don't know what you're gonna do. I don't know your response. So Susan, well, all I want you to do is I want you to move the water in this bucket and fill this. But you can't pick it up. You can only use the straw. I am so much more comfortable speaking to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's sermon than I am doing this right now. Well, just you volunteered. And, and, and remember, my whole point was, are you willing to say yes before you know the will of God? So this, <laughs> Susan was willing to say yes. And now that she knows, she may be second guessing. But okay. Not that I'm the Lord Can at I all. Can I have the instruction one more time? Yes. You have to move the water from this jug and fill this glass, and you can only use the straw. Okay? okay? All right, there you go. So you get started on that. However you choose to do it, you just work away over there. All right, the rest of you pay attention to me, okay? <laughs> That's going to happen, right? Now, Jesus was preparing his disciples for what was about to happen. He was about to depart. He was about to leave them, and he was going to go to Jerusalem where he knew he was going to be arrested, he would be tried, and ultimately he would be crucified. His disciples didn't really know that at this point, so he was trying to prepare them for this reality. But the entire time they had known Jesus, the entire time they had been working with Jesus, they, all they knew is that all they had to do was follow Jesus. I just see. do, yes. You can't do it? No, because I just swallowed it. <laughs> Now, Susan, there are other ways. I mean, you could hold the end of the straw and do it that way. That might be one, you know. Yeah. yeah but then how does it poison? No, just, so just stick the straw in there. I, well, I know, but Susan, you volunteered. There's nothing we can do now. I know. <laughs> so, so I, I mean, one of the things you can just, just do, maybe this, would this work? 
Yeah. Oh, okay. There you go. Why don't we switch? No, 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 no. No, because I know where this is going. All right. So Jesus is, Jesus is walking with his disciples. He is, he's been teaching them and he's been preparing them for this moment when Jesus would no longer be around. He would not be with them in order for them to understand, to know and do God's will. Now think about this. If you've ever had this thought, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you probably thought this. It was so much easier for the disciples because all they had to do was follow Jesus. Where Jesus went, they went. When Jesus said do something, they tried to do something. When Jesus taught something, they heard it. They could ask questions. But for those of us who live today, we don't get to see Jesus manifest presence. We don't get to walk. And if it would be so much easier if knowing and doing the will of God was simply following after Jesus. But Jesus was beginning to prepare his disciples for the reality that he was not always going to be with them. So as he's walking with his disciples to the Mount of Olives, where he was ultimately going to be betrayed and arrested, they passed by a vineyard. And as they're passing by this vineyard, it provided Jesus with the perfect illustration of an essential requirement for knowing and doing the will of God. So look with me at John chapter 15, beginning in verse 1, and here's what the scripture says. Jesus, as he's talking to his disciples, passing by this vineyard on the way to Mount of Olives, he says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the words I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. Now, I want to look at this passage, this section of the scripture, uh, verses one through six, and I want to answer some very basic ideas because I think we have to follow Jesus' metaphor if we're going to really understand. There are four metaphors in John 15 that we've looked at so far. The first one is the true vine. The true vine is Jesus, okay? He makes it very clear. I am the true vine, he says. So Jesus is the true vine. But the question is, if Jesus is the true vine, then there must be a... Yeah, it's not rocket science. If, there, if Jesus is the true vine, there must be a false vine. Very good, that's right. There must be a false vine. If you go back to the Old Testament, the idea of a vine is used in illustrations through the prophets many times. In fact, in Jeremiah 2, verse 21, this is what it says. This is God speaking through the prophet Jeremiah. Yet I planted you, talking about Israel, I planted you a choice vine, holy of pure seed. How then have you turned degenerate and become a wild vine. Now there are many references to Israel as this vine, as this wild vine. Jesus says though that I am the true vine. Jesus is the vine through whom the fruit of salvation was going to come. Israel had been God's chosen people, but out of Israel had not come the fruit of salvation. Jesus however says I am the true vine and from me this fruit will be born. Now here's why this is important for us. Because I'm convinced that throughout my lifetime, and maybe you feel this way too, I have often gone to false vines to try to draw the nutrients and bear fruit in my life. I have gone to the, I have gone to the vine of education. I have gone to the vine of my own abilities. I've gone to the vine of financial security. I've gone to all kinds of vines, that, and I've tried to draw from those vines my own security and my own comfort in the Lord. And what happens every time we do that? What happens when we go to a vine, the vine of a relationship, the, the vine of our career, the vine of our self-image? When we go to those vines, what we find is that we end up bearing no fruit. Jesus says, I am the true vine. If you want to bear the fruit in your life, if you want to bear fruit, then you remain in me. The question for all of us is what vines are we trying to draw our support and sustenance out of? Are we trying to draw life from anything other than Jesus? Are we trying to draw life out of religion? 
Are we trying to draw life out of a career, fame, sex, alcohol, drugs, popularity, social media? What vine are we going to? Because every vine other than Jesus is a false vine. Jesus says, I am the true vine. But he also says, uh, the vine dresser. My father is the vine dresser. The vine dresser is God. And as you're following this, this analogy, Jesus basically points that the vine dresser has two primary responsibilities. First, he inspects the fruit. He is looking to see that the branches are actually bearing fruit, that they're actually producing fruit. The, the other thing he does is he prunes the branches. Now notice something about this. He doesn't just prune the unproductive branches. Of course, if the branch is unproductive, he cuts it back. He also prunes the productive branches so that they will continue to produce more fruit. Now, now listen, what that tells me is that if you are here today and you are in a relationship with Jesus, whether you are productive in that relationship, whether, whether you are remaining connected to the vine and you are producing fruit, or whether you have become disconnected and you are not producing fruit, the one thing we have in common is that we will all be pruned. We will all be pruned. Productive and unproductive alike. Listen to what it says in the book of Hebrews. But the disciples, but, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. I think for many of us, we've gone through life, maybe we've done our best to try, stay connected to the vine, we've tried to be productive, and then something happens and we feel that pruning. We feel the cut of the pruning shears, and we say, why, God? Why would you do this to me? God, why, God, why would you allow this to happen? But here's what we need to know. The same God who is faithful in the goodness is faithful in in the pain, and that he says he will prune us in order for us to be able to produce more fruit. I love what Pastor Tim Keller says about this. Whatever he prunes is a gain to lose and would be a loss to keep. Whatever he prunes is a gain to lose and a loss to keep. And that is easy to say if you haven't experienced the loss. But if you've experienced the loss and you've continued to struggle to remain connected to the vine, there will come a time where you will understand that it was a gain to lose that and it would have been a loss to keep it. The vine dresser inspects the fruit and he prunes. And then the next analogy that he uses is the branch. And this is us. This is you. This is me, right? We have two responsibilities that Jesus lines out in this passage. First, to remain in him. To remain connected. My willingness to remain in him allows him to do in and through me what I cannot do for myself. Notice what Jesus said. Unless you remain in me, you will bear no fruit. So my job is to remain connected to the vine. That if I were to remain connected to the true vine, that's my number one job. Apart from him, I can do nothing. I'm a withered branch that is ultimately picked up and destroyed. Listen to what it says in Philippians 2, verse 12 and 13. Paul's writing to the Philippians church and he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you both to will and to act according to his good pleasure. Now, do you notice what seems like a contradiction in that verse? What, what is Paul saying? He said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it's God who works in you in order to, that his will will be accomplished in and through you. What is Paul saying? He is saying your job, your job, just like Jesus told his disciples, is to remain in him. Working out your salvation means your entire focus is how do I remain firmly rooted in the true vine? How do I remain rooted in Jesus? So first our job is to remain in him. But how do we do this? How, how are we to remain in Jesus? Well, if you read through John 15 and you read through the rest of the Gospels and throughout the New Testament, you will see that this is the idea of being constantly obedient, that we are constantly obedient to the call of Christ, that we are faithful to follow him in all situations, even when we don't understand, 
even when we can't see the outcome. Our job is to remain in him. That's what we're called to do. How you doing, Susan? I'm doing well. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you're making some progress. By, by next week, service time, Okay, should you should have it done. You, you just keep going. You're doing great over there, Susan. Doing, doing a great job. Thank you for your help. So, constant obedience. We stay, remain connected. This is what we're called to do. The second thing that our responsibility is, is to allow his word to remain in us. So, so if we're going to, if our answer to God is going to be yes, now God, what do you want me to do? If, if that's going to be our posture, that's our first posture, obedience. The second is for his word to remain in us. Psalm 119.11 says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God's word remaining in you is more than memorizing scripture, but it is not less than memorizing scripture. God's word remaining in you is more than memorizing scripture, but it is not less than memorizing scripture. Jesus, when he was talking to the Pharisees, who, by the way, would have memorized the Torah, They would have memorized huge sections of the prophets. This is what they spent their time doing, immersing themselves in God's word and memorizing. This is what Jesus said. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you. For you do not believe the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. What is Jesus saying to the Pharisees? He's saying, you have memorized the scripture, but you don't have the word of God abiding in you. Having the word of God abide in you is is more than just memorizing scripture, but it's not less than that. When Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, he tempted him by quoting scripture to him. Even Satan has scripture memorized It's not enough to memorize scripture. It means that God's word is abiding in you, meaning that it's not something you just know, but it's something that you live out. It's something that's born out in your life. The responsibility of the branch is to remain in him and to allow his word to remain in us. Now, let's look at the fourth, the fourth analogy that he gives in this teaching, and that's the fruit. What is the fruit? It is Christ-likeness. Galatians 5, through 23 gives the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Let me ask you, if you were to look back over your life this week, how much of that fruit was born in you this week? And I don't just mean when things were good. I mean pick your lowest moment this week, your lowest moment. The time where you heard the news you weren't expecting, when somebody didn't respond the way you had hoped they had responded, when they failed you, they they didn't follow through on a commitment, they lied when you were betrayed. In those lowest moments, how much of this fruit was born in your life? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. See, this is the fruit that Jesus says, if you will remain in me and my word will remain in you, this fruit will be born in you. Fruit is the result of of the spirit dwelling in us and it cannot be produced apart from him. Verse five says, apart from me, you can do some things. No, nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You see, here's the the challenge. Here's the problem we've got as followers of Jesus. Okay, well, the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I'm gonna try really hard this week to be patient. Right? I mean, this is what we do, right? Okay, I'm gonna work on patience. I'm gonna really work on patience. And I'm not saying you shouldn't, but I'm just, this is what we do. In our self-effort, we say, I'm gonna be more patient, or I'm gonna be more kind, or I'm gonna be good. I'm gonna be self-controlled. And we try to do it out of our own power. And Jesus is saying, you can do nothing apart from me. You can't be patient apart from me. You can't be loving apart from me. You can't have peace apart from me. And this is where Jesus talks about this fruit as being evidence of those who are truly following Jesus. Matthew 7, verse 20, Jesus said, you will know them by their fruit. 
You will know them by the fruit. You will know my disciples because of the fruit that is borne out in their lives. The great example of this is among Jesus' own followers. You look at Jesus' followers and they failed, they struggled, they tried over and over again. And yet you see many times uh, they bore the fruit and sometimes they failed to bear the fruit. But there was one disciple who we know did not bear the fruit. That was Judas. Some branches do not bear fruit. Some branches do not remain in the vine and therefore do not bear fruit. This applies to individuals. It applies to churches. That if we are going to bear the fruit of Christ's likeness, we must remain connected to Jesus and we must have his word abiding inside of us. Jesus goes on in verse seven and he says, if you remain in me and my word remains in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now here it is again, remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have obeyed my father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Now, we love this passage of scripture. This is probably one that you may have heard before. You know, ask anything in my name and I will give it to you. We love to take that little part of this passage and we pull it right out of context, don't we? But, but I want us to look at the three conditions for getting whatever you ask of God. Because he's, he's, there are three conditions that he says. The, the word if appears three times. Look at what he says first. If you remain in me. That's first. If, you are, if God is going to answer whatever you ask of him, the first thing is you have to remain in him. The second thing is if my word remains in you. If you remain in me and my word remains in you. And third, if you bear fruit. If your life is bearing fruit. So, so what is that fruit? Well, it's obedience, right? Right? That we live in perfect obedience, that our answer to God is, yes, Lord, here I am. Yes, Lord, my answer is yes, I don't know even what you're going to ask me to do. My answer is yes. The fruit is obedience. What is the result of that obedience? The result of that obedience is that we experience God's love and the joy and the satisfaction that his love brings. That as he, as his love begins to flow through us and the fruit is born in us, we experience the joy of knowing God. That's what we're gonna talk about for the next several weeks as we talk about experiencing God. How do I experience the fullness of joy? And the answer is knowing and doing God's will. And here's the thing. If you could live this way, if anyone in this room could live this way perfectly, if, if you could remain in Jesus, if you could remain fully immersed in his will, if you could walk in perfect obedience, then according to Jesus, you can ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. But let me ask you, if all of those things, if all those conditions were true of you, would you ever ask for anything of God that was not of his will? If you were remaining in Jesus and Jesus were remaining in you and you were living in perfect obedience, would you ever ask God for anything outside of his will? Here's the, the illustration that I think really brought this passage to life for me several years ago. In understanding, well, God, this is your word. You said, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. How can I reconcile that with the fact that I've had so many times in my life where my prayer has not been answered? How can I reconcile it? And, and of course, I could reconcile it by simply saying, well, I'm not abiding in God, right? I'm not abiding in Christ. You know, he, his word's not abiding in me. I need to study the scripture more. I, I, there's some area in my life where I'm not being obedient. If I had just been more obedient, then God would answer my prayer. And I do all this, all this in self-effort, right? All of this is me working this out. And then one day it occurred to me. And the way it occurred to me was my wife went back to work. She had stayed home with our kids. We'd been blessed for her to stay home with our kids for 14 years, and she went back to work. Eventually, she found herself working in uh, the mayor's office. And she uh, eventually found herself in the job of being his correspondence writer. Let me tell you what that means. She was a ghostwriter. She would write things for the mayor, and he would sign his name on the bottom. Now, the process for this was pretty incredible. She ended up doing this for two mayors and for the governor 
And she, she was basically writing all their written correspondence, all the emails, anything that came out in print. Sherry was the one who was writing that. But was it Sherry's words? No. What she was doing is she had to understand the policy. She had to take the question. She had to draft an answer. She had to send it to the general counsel where the general counsel would review it. That had to go to his policy advisors where it would be reviewed. Eventually, it might make its way back to the chief executive where he would read it. He would ask for changes. It would go back to Sherry. She would adjust the letter. She would adjust the correspondence. It would go through the process again until eventually at some point, the person would sign the letter. And it occurred to me, that's what this is talking about. This is talking about living in such tight relationship with God, abiding in Jesus so much that, that his policies, his will, his desire, his ways, it's not about me, it has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with his word abiding in me, that his word flows through me to the point where I pray not even according to my own will and desires, but I live such a surrendered life that I pray only in accordance to the desires of King Jesus. And I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but if you, like me, end your prayers with, in Jesus' name, amen, what are you actually saying? You are actually signing Jesus' name to the bottom of your prayer. This is the whole point of a ghostwriter. Not that the ghostwriter gets to write what he or she wants to write according to his will or his desire, but they have become so immersed in the desire and will of the person whose name they are putting at the bottom of the letter that they are only interested in his will flowing through them. That's what God's calling us to be. See, here's, here's what I think as we get into this series of knowing and doing the will of God, that we need to fully understand that until we are willing to be fully surrendered to Jesus, we are not in a position to know and do the will of God. Knowing and doing the will of God requires full surrender to Jesus Christ. Until we are willing to abide in Jesus and to have his word abide in us, until our answer is yes, before we even know the question, we cannot bear the kind of fruit in our lives. That, we, that he is calling us to bear. And here's the key. If you have never surrendered yourself to Jesus, you must know that doing, knowing and doing the will of God starts there. If you wanna know and do the will of God, you have to begin by surrendering your heart and life to Jesus Christ. If you've never done that, there's no way you can know and do his will. There's no way that you can understand his will. It starts there. And you say, well, I, there's so much I don't understand. Of course there's such, so much you don't understand. There are those in the room who've been following Jesus for decades, and we still don't fully understand. But you know what? It's not our job to understand. It's our job to remain in the vine and have his word remain in us and to live in obedience. And for those of us who have surrendered to Jesus but are still living out of our own strength, we're still trying to draw life out of other vines, we need to remember that Jesus has called us to abide in him, to remain in him. It's not about your effort. It's about Jesus abiding, abiding in Jesus and about his life flowing through you. Which brings me back to Susan. You have done a great job. Will you give Susan a hand? Now, Susan... I mean, that's not bad, actually. I don't know how long the sermon was, but that's pretty good for that length of time. Now, here's the, here's the thing, Susan. Every bit of the water that you moved from this to here was all about your effort. Every, it was about your effort with the straw moving it. Here's the, here's the thing about straws. Um, when we are called to be the, the branches that remain in the vine, that remain in the true vine, a lot of times we think the effort, much like a straw, is we suck out of the vine what we need. Like it's about our effort. We suck out of Jesus what we need. But do you know that horticulturalists say that, vine, that branches do not actually suck nutrients out of the vine? That, that in fact, it doesn't work that way at all. That the vine itself pushes nutrients through the branches that bears the fruit. See, we live our Christian life 
most of the time, like straws. We think, well, I'm going to plug into Jesus, and I'm going to suck out of Jesus what I need. But the truth of the matter is, it really is a garden hose. (laughs) It's really a garden hose. It's two different ways It's two different ways to live your life in Jesus. You're going to live your life like you're a straw sucking nutrients out of Jesus, or you're going to live your life like a garden hose. And you're going to trust that Jesus is going to push through you what you need in order to do what he's called you to do. This is is the difference in the prayer life, right? If I pray like a straw, I'm plugging into Jesus, and I'm trying to suck out of Jesus what I want. Instead of seeing prayer as a garden hose where I just turn on the faucet and I let God's will flow in and through me. This is what Jesus has called us to do, to remain in him. Thank you, Susan. Great job. Appreciate you. So here's the the conclusion. And I worked on this hard. It might not sound like it. But this this is what I want you to do, okay? This is the whole, here's what it gets down to, and you'll remember this. Stop sucking and start abiding. (laughs) If you want to know and do the will of God, stop sucking and start abiding. What does that mean for you? What does that mean for you? It means it's not about your effort, although it doesn't mean that you're passive in the situation, does it? Your job is to remain in Jesus. What would happen this week if your whole goal was simply to remain in Jesus and to invite his word to remain in you? And your answer is, yes, Lord, whatever you want. And when you prayed, your prayer was, Father, your will, not mine, be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What if you lived your life this week in such a way that you stopped sucking and you just abided in Jesus? This is what we're called to do. So next week, we're going to start experiencing God, and I want to invite you to participate in this. And this is one of the ways you can say abiding in Christ. This is one of the ways you can do it, by participating with us over this series. And this series is a little different than some other other series, because it's a series that we're hoping to be uh, an immersive experience for you in our worship services. We want you to be in worship every week. Um, If you can't be here, uh, join us online. If you can't be in person, join us online. We want you in a small group. Uh, many of our small groups are going to be using some material uh, by Henry Blackaby, The Seven Realities of Experiencing God, and you'll be studying the life of Moses in your small groups, and then also a daily quiet time. Uh, we're going to provide some material that you can pick up next week, a, a workbook that will give you daily assignments, simple daily assignments that you can follow along that will keep God's word in you and hopefully help you stay abiding in Jesus. And here's the challenge for us during Experiencing God. What would it look like at the end of eight or nine weeks if an entire church, an entire church, just the people in this room, just the people in our second service, what would it look like if all of us just simply said yes to God? What would it look like if we said yes to God? That's the challenge. I hope you'll participate. I hope you'll be a part of it.